topic uh, related to the use of uh, digital screens uh, in the form of, let's say, smartphones or iPads, uh, televisions, in as much as they're being used for immersive video games, etc. The book, if you're interested, looks like this, Glow Kids, Nicholas Cardaris. Um, it was a little different than I was anticipating. Uh, Cardaris, for his part, uh, works in the field of addiction, and now he's taken up this particular, uh, this particular field of uh, addiction to screens, in particular for young men and their addiction to video games. And so he spends a fairly uh, decent amount of time in this book um, talking about video games in particular. He spends a chunk of the book talking about the relationship between violent video games and the increase of aggression, yeah. violent video games, and you know their possible connection to more heinous criminal activity, although he recognizes that that's a somewhat limited uh, data point in terms of, you know, violent video games contributing to something like a mass shooting or whatever the case may be. Um, but he does spend a fair bit of time there. I, w I was anticipating that it was going to be uh, much more balanced in terms of its treatment of the social media effect and the use of smartphone devices, et cetera, like that. Uh, but nevertheless, there's some useful things in here, and we'll, I'll, I'll go through some, like a brief summary of the book. But this is what it looks like. I also uh, read, did not finish the whole thing, but this Neil Postman book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which was written in the 80s, 1984. Um, and so uh, we'll start out with some considerations from Neil Postman. He's kind of assessing the issue from, let's say, the 50,000 foot view. And I think his, his concerns about um, importing new media and new technology uh, are more prescient, uh, whereas Cardaris spends a lot more time on the cause of uh, screen addiction, and then the subsequent sympt symptoms that follow after. Um, Postman is dealing more with a kind of philosophical question related to the introduction of technology. So how we're going to start is with a couple of poems. Poetry with Pastor. <laughs> um, and the first one, I think, sort of embodies in a, in sort of a funny way, but also a morbid way, uh, what Cardaris is primarily doing in his book that is addressing the cause of screen addiction and its subsequent symptoms. The second poem is a little more idyllic, and it's dealing with kind of the nature of how children used to interact with the world. And that's more of Postman's concern, at least in the initial part of his book. So I'm gonna read this poem. At the end, you can tell me who you think wrote it. I did not write it. Um, okay, it is as follows. The most important thing we've learned so far as children are concerned is never, never, never let them near your television set. Or better still, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. In almost every house we've been, we've watched them gaping at the screen. They loll and slop and lounge about and stare until their eyes pop out. Last week in someone's place, we saw a dozen eyeballs on the floor. They sit and stare and stare and sit until they're hypnotized by it, until they're absolutely drunk with all that shocking, ghastly junk. Oh yes, we know it keeps them still. They don't climb out the windowsill. They'll never fight or kick or punch. They'll leave you free to cook the lunch and wash the dishes in the sink. But did you ever stop to think, to wonder just exactly what this does to your beloved tot? It rots the sense in the head. It kills imagination dead. It clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes a child so dull and blind. He can no longer understand a fantasy of fairyland. His brain becomes as soft as cheese. His powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think. He only sees. All right, you'll cry. All right, you'll say. But if we take the set away, what shall we do to entertain our darling children? Please explain. We'll answer this by asking you. What use the darling ones to do? How use they keep themselves contented before this monster was invented? Have you forgotten, don't you know? We'll say it very loud and slow. They used to read. They'd read and read and read and read and then proceed to read some more. Great Scott Gadzooks, one half their shelves, uh, one half their lives was reading books. The nursery shelves had books galore, books cluttered up the nursery floor. And in the bedroom by the bed, more books were waiting to be read. Such wondrous, fine, fantastic tales of dragons, gypsies, queens, and whales and treasure isles and distant shores where smugglers rowed with muffled oars and pirates wearing purple pants and sailing ships and elephants and cannibals crouching round the pot, stirring away at something hot. 
It smells so good, what can it be? Good gracious, it's Penelope. The younger ones had Beatrix Potter with Mr. Todd, the dirty rotter, and Squirrel Nutkin, Pigling Bland, and Mrs. Tiggly Winkle, and just how the camel got his hump, and how the monkey lost his rump, and Mr. Toad, and bless my soul, there's Mr. Rat and Mr. Mole. Oh, books, what books they used to know, those children living long ago. So please, oh please, we beg, we pray, go throw your TV set away, and in its place you can install a lovely bookshelf on the wall. Then fill the shelves with lots of books, ignoring all the dirty looks, the screams and yells, the bites and kicks, and children hitting you with sticks. Fear not, because we promise you that in about a week or two of having nothing else to do, they'll now begin to feel the need of having something to read. And once they start, oh boy, oh boy, you watch the slowly growing joy that fills their hearts. They'll grow so keen. They'll wonder what they'd ever seen in that ridiculous machine, that nauseating, foul, unclean, repulsive television screen. And later, each and every kid will love you more for what you did. <laughs> okay, any guesses as to where that come from? Close. <laughs> it sort of sounds that way, right? It's kind of catchy in the Dr. Seuss way. No? Anybody else? It's from Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So it's an Oompa Loompa song. You remember the Gene Wilder one? Mike TV, the little kid that liked the westerns, and then he gets zapped through the Wonka vision and he's like this big. It doesn't sound like that in, the, in that movie anyway, but uh, <laughs> so it's, it's a poem within uh, Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Now, its connection to Nicholas Cardaris's book again is that the poem, uh, maybe in exaggerated ways, is trying to show that there is, uh, in a, you know, these negative outcomes and effects to children simply being sucked in and hypnotized uh, on, a, on a television set. Um, where they're unable to think. You notice that one line that I particularly like, um, that, they, uh, that they no longer, he cannot think, he only sees, right? That, and if, if you only see and you don't think, right, then you're, then you're not really, let's say, being critical. You're just, things are coming into your eyes and you're taking for granted what you see is uh, true or whatever, whatever else it may be. Nicholas Cardaris also kind of is going to sketch out the connection between screen addiction and the sort of mal behavior of children. And um, not to put my own children on the spot, but it's, it's clear that some kind of agitation is increased in children when they spend uh, a number of hours on a television screen or, or some other kind of device. Um, and to pull them away from it is quite difficult, right? I could never tell my kids, sit in this spot on the floor while I go do this thing for 15 minutes, but I don't even have to tell them, <laughs> sit here for two and a half hours and watch this movie or whatever. And, that, and then if the next one loads, it'll just, you know, <laughs> you'll just be there, you'll be there forever. So in any case, that's kind of a, a, a funnier, let's say, diagnosis of the problem. But that poem's written in 1964, right? So uh, that's not even in view of the kind of immersive technologies that we have now, right? That's just uh, looking at a fairly bland screen. I don't know when they shifted from, from black and white to color, but you know, whatever, whatever was on the, on the boob tube in 1964 was not nearly as, let's say, captivating um, a, as what we have represented in much of the technology today. Okay, so that's the first one. Any thoughts on that? Okay. All right, the second one is a little more idyllic. Uh, it's by Walt Whitman, um, <clears throat> who along with Henry David Thoreau and Emerson, and maybe Ernest Hemingway to a certain extent, I think these guys were called transcendentalists, something like uh, a carrying on of the earlier romanticists, like uh, Keats and Wordsworth, these poets that were sort of rebuffing the, the kind of enlightenment notions that we're only dealing within a world of like brute scientific facts. That they, that they want to um, illuminate and set forth the beauty in nature um, and the materialist world doesn't really account for beauty because beauty is not a fact in the same way that, that what this weighs is a fact, right? Um, but the problem with the romantics and with the transcendentalists I think is that some of them, some of the earlier ones may have been Christian, some of the later ones may not have been, and they, they kind of have a trade-off where 
the real world, like we, as we're going to hear from Whitman, we might have more in common with the transcendentalist who wants a kid to be out in the real world. But if you think that the real world is its own ground of being, then you're creating an idol of creation. And it's not exactly being appropriated the right way. Um, but, but this poem, to, to kind of illustrate the, the impulse of, uh, uh, of Postman, is Whitman talking about what a child would have done in his everyday life and the things he would have encountered and the effects that they would have had. So it's as follows. There was a child went forth every day, and the first object he looked upon and received with wonder or pity or love or dread, that object he became, and that object became part of him for the day or a certain part of the day, or for many years or stretching cycles of years. The early lilacs became part of this child in grass and white and red morning glories and white and red clover and the song of the Phoebe bird and the March-born lambs and the sow's pink faint litter and the mare's foal, and the cow's calf, and the noisy brood of the barnyard, or by the mire of the pond side, and the fish suspending themselves so curiously below there, and the beautiful curious liquid, and the water plants, and their graceful flat heads, all became a part of him. And the field sprouts of April and May became part of him, winter grain sprouts, and those of the light yellow corn, and of the esculent roots of the garden, and the apple trees covered with blossoms and the fruit afterward, and wood berries and the commonest weeds by the road, and the old drunkard staggering home from the outhouse of the tavern whence he had lately risen, and the schoolmistress that passed on her way to the school, and the friendly boys that passed, and the quarrelsome boys, and the tidy and fresh-cheeked girls, and the barefoot negro boy and girl, and all the changes of city and country wherever he went. His parents gave him afterward every day, they and of them became a part of him. The mother at home quietly placing the dishes on the supper table. The mother with mild words clean her cap and gown, a wholesome odor falling off her person and clothes as she walks by. The father, strong, self-sufficient, manly, mean, angered, unjust. The blow, the quick loud word, the tight bargain, the crafty lure. The family usages, the language, the company, the furniture, the yearning and swelling heart affection that will not be gainsay, the sense of what is real, the thought if after all it should prove unreal, the doubts of daytime and the doubts of nighttime, the curious whether and how, whether that which appears so is so, or is it all flashes and specks? Men and women crowding fast in the streets, if they are not flashes and specks, what are they? The streets themselves and the facades of houses, the goods and the windows, vehicles, teams, uh, the tiered wharves, and the huge crossing of the ferries, the village on the highland seen from afar at sunset, the river between, shadows and mist, light falling on roofs and gables of white or brown three miles off, the schooner nearby sleepily drooping down the tide, the little boat slack towed astern, the hurrying tumbling waves and quick broken crests and slapping, the strata of colored clouds, the long bar of maroon tint away solitary by itself the spread of purity it lies motionless in, the horizon's edge, the flying sea crow, the fragrance of salt marsh and shore mud, these became a part of the child who went forth every day and who now goes and will always go forth every day, and these become of him or her that pursues, peruses them now. Okay, so, so Whitman is clearly describing a childhood that is fairly dissimilar to much of the childhood that's, that's experienced in the 21st century, right? When he says that the child will go out every day, will always do this, uh, turned out not to be the case because we've had such an incursion of what is not really real, right? And this is gonna get at Postman's concern, which we can get into now, because his critique of new media and technology isn't just looking at the outcome or the effects, right? He's not, he's not Postman is not necessarily like a doctor who when you go and visit, he says, well, I see you have this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, and here's how we're gonna treat them, right? Uh, Postman is more like prescient or a prophet, saying this is what we ought to have in mind when we're introducing uh, new media or new, uh, or new technology, which is something different from Cardaris, who as a clinical psychologist is mostly dealing in the realm of symptom and then diagnosing some solution in order to take care of the symptom. But Postman's trying to get 
behind, he's trying to get behind the symptoms and say, what's really at root or what's the deeper question uh, we really ought to be asking. So before we move to some Postman quotes, and I hope that we can have some discussion, are there any thoughts on either of those things? <laughs> you didn't know that you were going to get a live poetry reading. Okay. I didn't hear anybody doing the, you know, the poetry snapping, yes? I much prefer the life described in the second one. Yeah. The nature, the, the just earthiness, real. Right, right. Yes. And, you know, as I said, too, that, that can have its own problems for a different reason. If, if you're a naturalist who becomes, you know, an environmentalist, like, you know, it becomes your religion. Because when we look out at that tree, we know that tree does not have in itself its own ground of being, right? It exists by the, the divine prerogative of God, who said to the earth, sprout up all sorts of vegetation. And that tree is held together by the word of God right now, right? As we all are. And so our experience of nature as Christians, that's really real, right? The, the one who's a materialist, it do, he doesn't necessarily account for the reality because he's, he's not seeing that that tree is to declare the glory of God or the heavens above are to declare. But that's certainly a better alternative, right? You'd rather have the Whitman alternative than the Mark Zuckerberg alternative, <laughs> right? Which is like to get out, like to get so much into the digital world that it begins to feel like the real world. And it's like, why don't you just prefer the world <laughs> or the creation that we're in? But yes, yeah, it's a much, uh, a much nicer vision, right? Okay, well, here's a quote from, uh, uh, from Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, Postman writes, what is peculiar about the interpositions of media that is, these technologies that sort of break into time, is that their role in directing what we will see or know is so rarely noticed. So this is him getting behind the symptoms. And he's, he's asking an earlier question, right? The, the Cardaris is saying, hey, your addiction to screen screens is making you more agitated, depressed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, Postman is trying to get behind all of that and saying, uh, that there's something about these technologies that are directing culture and our conception of man in a way that we don't really notice their effect. So he goes on. A person who reads a book or who watches television or who glances at his watch is not usually interested in how his mind is organized and controlled by these events, still less what idea of the world is suggested by a book, television, or a watch. But there are men who have noticed these things, especially in our own time. Lewis Mumford, for example, has been one of our great noticers. He is not the sort of man who looks at a clock merely to see what time it is. Not that he lacks interest in the content of clocks, which is of concern to everyone from moment to moment. But Mumford is far more interested in how a clock creates the idea of moment to moment. He attends to the philosophy of clocks to clocks as metaphors about which our education has had little to say and clockmakers nothing at all. The clock, Mumford concluded, is a piece of power machinery whose product is seconds and minutes. In manufacturing such a product, the clock has the effect of dissociating time from human events and thus nourishes the belief in an independent world of mathematically measurable sequences. Moment to moment, it turns out, is not God's conception or nature's. It is, a, it is man's conversing with himself about and through a piece of machinery he created. So here he's, he's using this insight from Lewis Mumford that he's going to later apply to television. This is his main concern in Amusing Ourselves to Death in 1984. He's going to take Mumford's uh, observation about the clock and how its introduction uh, caused, let's say, the philosophy of culture and man and the passage of time to fundamentally shift. So when, when Postman remarks, moment to moment is not God's conception, but rather man's conversing with himself through a piece of machinery, what is God's conception of time? Rather than just simple, like a mere moment, to, like how is it measured so far as the scriptures are concerned in Genesis? Right, yes. 
Yeah, so well, in this next quote, we'll get into this question of a clock, the, the creation of a clock's bearing on how much we think of eternity. But the, the, the passage of time in the sacred scripture is seasonal, right? It's not minute, it's not second by second. It's not minute by minute. It's, uh, it's seasonal. And so your day is going to look different in December. More of a flowing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As opposed to finite. Right. Chunks or something. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll see from this other quote from Mumford what, what he sees the concern is and why, and why I'm bringing this up, I'll, I'll say in just a moment. Um, well, so Postman goes on and says, in Mumford's great book, Technics and Civilization, he shows how beginning in the 14th century, the clock made us into timekeepers first, and then time savers, and now time servers. <laughs> so we, we were always, let's say, subject to the seasons or whatever, but we are time servers. The nine to five, right? The grind. I got to get there on time. We're, we're a very scheduled, and, and in some ways it has its advantages, right? So that we can, we can all show up at a place at the same time. I suppose there would have been a way to measure that in the past. Um, but we now become servants to the thing that we first created to be of service to us, right? Suddenly the invention is the one driving the car, and, and it's taking us wherever it, wherever it chooses. He goes on, in the process, we have learned irreverence toward the sun and the seasons. For in a world made up of seconds and minutes, the authority of nature is suspended. Uh, indeed, as Mumford points out, with, with the invention of the clock, eternity ceased to serve as the measure and the focus of human events. And thus, though few would have imagined the connection, the inexorable ticking of the clock may have had more to do with the weakening of God's supremacy than all the treatises produced by the philosophers of the Enlightenment. That is to say, the clock introduced a new form of conversation between man and God, in which God appears to be the loser. Perhaps Moses should have included another commandment, thou shalt not make mechanical representations of time. Okay, so there, uh, there especially, uh, this Mumford, his, his concern that the, inven the invention of the clock has caused eternity to cease to to serve as the measure and the focus of human events. This, you know, like when, when St. Augustine deals with the question of time in the Confessions, Book 11, um, and he kind of gets wrapped up in what is the present, what is the past, what is the future. I feel like I'm in the present, but as soon as I start to speak, time is passing, and what I just said 10 seconds ago is now in the past, et cetera, et cetera. He resolves that tension by quoting St. Paul in Philippians, who says, forgetting what lies behind me, and pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord, so that so that the problem of time is sort of is sort of uh, directed to the person of Christ and the promise of eternal life. Like that's what our seasons, that's what our days are ultimately going toward. Some kind of teleological point, right? A fulfillment. Um, and and so there there is some sense in Mumford that the that, that sense of eternity. Uh, over time cease to serve as the measure and focus of human events. And certainly that would be the case, I think, today. We don't even, in, in American society now, I think Western society, we don't celebrate seasons anymore. Yeah. Even when I was little, we still went through, there, there was a rhythm to the year, you know, Thanksgiving to Christmas, Lent, Easter, etc. Right. And now it's, I don't know, it's the school year or the football or basketball season or whatever. Right, right. Or it's just simply everything is the same all 12 months of the year, and it's just a nine to five. Right, right. It's this artificial division. Yeah. So you can see how that's played out since that was written. Right, yeah. So there's like a diso I mean, for us, it's a dissociation because we don't live in a kind of home economy anymore, right? You, 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 you didn't have a choice but to be present to the seasons in an earlier era because your, your actual life depended on Season, season, right. Planting, <laughs> right. So there are some people who are still intimately joined to that way of thinking, but whether or not it's it's caught up into this kind of higher sense that even those seasons are moving toward eternity is also another question. Um, and so you know, I mean, it could be it could be over exaggerated as to how much the clock has affected our way of thinking, but it does seem to have had a an effect in some way, right? Um, and I especially like the, the sense of us as the clock servant. There's a quote I put in here from 
Henry David Thoreau, men have become the tools of their tools. <laughs> so they're, they're the ones calling the shots now, right? Get to where you need to be, or whatever the case may be. Now, this is the ultimate point from Postman. What I mean to point out here is that the introduction into a culture of a technique, such as writing or a clock, is not merely an extension of man's power to bind time, but a transformation of his way of thinking, and of course, of the content of his culture. In every tool we create, he says, an idea is embedded that goes beyond the function of the thing itself. In every tool we create, an, an idea is embedded that goes beyond the function of the thing itself. And then he uses this other example. It has been pointed out that the invention of the eyeglasses in the 12th century not only made it possible to improve defective vision, but suggested the idea that human beings need not accept as final either the endowments of nature or the ravages of time. Eyeglasses refuted the belief that anatomy is destiny by putting forward the idea that our bodies, as well as our minds, are improvable. I do not think it goes too far to say that there is a link between the invention of eyeglasses in the 12th century and gene-splitting research in the 20th. <laughs> now again, how, how you know, connected those two things are, I think the, the caution from Postman is that when, en when, en when anything is introduced, especially now as we're, as we're having things introduced at such a rapid pace, this kind of reflection needs to be made. That in every tool we create, an idea is embedded that goes beyond the function of the thing itself. In other words, there's some kind of philosophy that's giving birth to some of these things. And what is it exactly? You know, so for example, when we think about the social media uh, website, Facebook, right? When Facebook first came online, it was only for those who were college age students. Do you even remember this? That's how it was started. It was, it was actually connected to a university ID, right? So in other words, you couldn't have a Facebook if you weren't in the university system. And what was, to use Postman's expression, what was the idea embedded beyond the function of Facebook? What was the idea embedded in creating this this network uh, on the internet. What was, what was Zuckerberg hoping to achieve through the creation of Facebook? An online world. Well, I mean, that's ultimately where it's, where it's, it's gone. Initially, the, the idea embedded was, uh, was, I mean, alleged social connection. But the idea embedded in making that social connection on the internet was there's something too limiting about man's social life like this. So we need to free man of his limited social <clears throat> circle, right? Which, you know, prior to Facebook or prior to the internet could really only have occurred in, the, in your church, right? Or in the town that you live in. Um, it, you know, nobody knows the town drunk that's stumbling back from the tavern out of that outhouse from Whitman's poem, right? When my mom was growing up in Milltown, Montana, people knew who the town drunk was, right? Because there was some kind of, but now you can just ignore the town drunk because you're connected in a broader way, right? And so the idea embedded in Facebook is that there's something deficient in the limited social network that man by necessity must endure because of the way that the real world is. And so what we're going to do is uh, broaden out his social web by permitting him to be socially connected to his buddy who's going to Rhode Island University or whatever, you know, but he's over on the West Coast. So now he can expand it, right? And what are they finding? What, what are they finding in, in the, let's say, increase of these social connecti connectivity networks on the internet. Well, greater loneliness for one thing. <laughs> the exact opposite thing they were trying to do, right? Because as it turns out, the problem they were trying to overcome is not really a problem. There isn't a problem that man's social life exists within what we as Christians would call vocation, which by its very definition is limited. It can't you know, I can't do my vocation except where my feet are planted. And so, so it has had this, this, this opposite effect. 
and we'll talk a little later about virtual reality and how they're trying to overcome that. Not, not admitting defeat, right? Not putting up the white flag and saying, I guess we were wrong. We couldn't broaden out man's social connectivity by connecting him to thousands of people all over the world. And one, one study that Cardaris notes is, uh, by self-reporting, the more friends you have on Facebook, the more depressed you are. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, and, and whether that's just correlative rather than causative, I don't know. But, um, but, it, but it isn't, there isn't this, the, the humility to admit defeat and try to do an about face. But the idea embedded in the creation of that network is now, they're like, no, the idea was right. Man can be connected beyond his limited, his limited capacities, and we're going to figure out a way to do it. And that way is Neuralink or whatever, or VR immersive reality. And, and, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. So, so that's, you know, the, um, the, this presentation isn't meant to be like, um, you know, an indictment on all things technological or a suggestion that it would be a sin to ever play a video game or to use these things, but to make sure that we have enough prescience. This is what's lacking uh, probably in every era, right? Postman says people are not asking questions like this. That's, that's probably universally been true. Um, so we just begin to ask these questions. When I take up a new thing, what is the, what's the idea embedded? And that goes beyond the mere function of the thing itself. Right? What is the idea embedded in a smartphone? It has, all, it has limitless function, seemingly. But what's the idea embedded in it? And, and what is that kind of pushing us toward? Okay, he, go, he goes on. It has been pointed out, for example, that the invent... Oh, I already read that. Okay. Um, all right, this is a recycling of a quote uh, from a presentation that I did for the men from Romano Guardini. He says, power can create evil as well as good. It can destroy as well as construct. What happens to power depends on man's tempered exercise of it, upon the reason uh, end to which he places it. Close examination proves that recent years, and this is in the mid-1900s, uh, proves that recent years have been marked by a monstrous, monstrous growth in man's power over being, over things and over men. But the grave responsibility the clear consciousness, the strong character needed for exercising this power well have not kept pace with its growth at all. Contemporary man has not been trained to use power well, nor has he, even in its loosest sense, an awareness of the problem itself. Man seems alert to the crisis of power today only in its limited external dangers. And the example now with regard to screens when, when Guardini says, man seems only alert to the crisis of power in its limited external dangers. You go around and ask people of a, a, a later generation, what do you see when you go to a restaurant? They, yeah, TVs, screens on the table. When I go to a restaurant and I can order my meal, on a, I push it to the side. I'm like, you, I'm, give, I'm gonna give you a tip after all, so you better get over here and take my order. Not only so, but it's good to interact with another human being. Or like bank tellers. For years, I had bank tellers telling me, you know, you can just deposit these checks online. I'm like, wouldn't that put you out of a job? Like, what are you here for, right? And maybe I like to talk to you. <laughs> but yes, so, so people are, are, are aware of those limited external dangers. People can see that we're becoming disconnected. Um, but they're not, as, um, as Gordini is suggesting, they're not at all asking this question, how how are these things to be used responsibly? So he seems alert to the crisis of power today only in its limited external dangers, such as clearly arose during the recent war uh, and were then publicly discussed. The present lack of an ethic, one both true and effective, for controlling power's use tends to breed further illusion. The use of power is accepted simply as another natural process. Its only norms are taken from alleged necessity, the need to do these things, from either utility or security. Power is never considered in terms of the responsibility for choice, which is inherent in freedom. And that last couple sentences, this is, this is really an important thing. When he says that this, this acceptance and use of power is set forth as, a, as an alleged necessity from either utility or security, that is really what drives, it seems to me, the train of the, the, the sheer multiplication of new technologies. As if, we're under, as if we're under some kind of 
uh, uh, impulse to make them because if we don't, we'll be in trouble. I watched this interview with uh, Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro, it was like five years ago, and they have some slightly different views on economics and Ben Shapiro, his, he, like for him, the bottom line is how, how do you make money in a capitalistic economy? He doesn't necessarily care about the cultural effect in, to a certain extent. So he asked Tucker Carlson this question. If you were the president, and now we have, they were talking about self-driving cars, and he says, you know, if you were the president, would you basically shut down the effort to innovate towards self-driving cars? And Tucker Carlson was like, are you joking? Is that a serious question? And he said, of course I would. I would do it in a minute. And he said, the reason why is because the trucking business <laughs> is the place where most young men who are not college educated get their work from. So what kind of destruct destruction would that have on families if we suddenly just took that work away and we had automatic cars that were driving around unpiloted by a human being? But the further point that he made was, he said, I'm astonished always by, you know, by conservatives who think that the machines are the one in control. Like to suggest that we slow down and when you, because you hear people say, well, the genie's already out of the bottle. It's here. What do we do about it? We can't put it back in. As if the machines are in control. We are living in something like a matrix where, the, where as Thoreau says, we become the tools of our tools. So it's like we're, we're looking at the smartphone and saying, we can't put this genie back in the, well, why not? I mean, it's, it's for sheer lack of will, right? Uh, because I think it would be too hard to do it. But maybe in certain instances, there is, a, there is a wisdom not to let the power, the ability to do a thing, out past the ethic, the, quest, the better question as to whether or not it ought to be done. Because there is always a fallout, right? Now, Cardaris uh, describes Postman, unfortunately. He says, perhaps a bit conspiratorially, Neil Postman believed that there was a political subtext to addicting electronic media, just as Soma in uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World was a mechanism of societal control. So too was our electronic addiction sedating the masses to make us more vulnerable to oppression. And then he says further, of course, Neil Postman wasn't the first person to cast a wary, perhaps even apocalyptic eye toward a new form of communication technology. History is replete with technophobic chicken littles who warned against the evils of everything from typewriter to the telegraph to radio moving pictures. Uh, all of those inventions had their own detractors who were convinced that the fill in the blank latest technology advancement would bring about the end of civilization. That's hardly true of Postman's book. He is not at all uh, a technophobic chicken little. He's simply asking a more prescient question, which is that what would the sensibility of not moving into the television age have been? And no one was even willing to slow down enough to think about the question, let alone try to give some answer to it, right? And as it seems, uh, Neil Postman wasn't so much a conspiracy theorist because the technology is being used precisely in the way that Cardara sort of detracts from Postman's alleged, you know, uh, prophecy of how it was going to be used. <laughs> Namely that it would be an, an, an addicting electronic media uh, somewhat similar to the drug in Brave New World. To control the masses, not by what they hate, but by what they love. And this is like the, the first part of Postman's book was, you know, written in 1984, he said, we, we finally arrived at the date, and all of these Americans are glibly saying, we survived Orwell's, you know, bleak prophecy. And none of them stopped to realize that we didn't survive Huxley's. And so his, his books, he says, this book is written in an effort to prove that Huxley rather than Orwell was right. That man is being enslaved to slovenliness, to things that he loves according to the flesh, in such a way that he's kind of sedated. Um, so, so the concern here is not simply to say that all technological advancements are bad, right? That's the, that's the technophobic chicken little who irrationally says that the sky is falling. That's not Postman's view. In fact, he says this in one part of his book. Anyone who is even slightly familiar with the history of communications knows that every new technology for thinking involves a trade-off. It giveth and it taketh away although not quite in equal measure. Media change does not necessarily result in equilibrium. 
It sometimes creates more than it destroys. Sometimes it is the other way around. We must be careful in praising or condemning because the future may hold surprises for us. So he's not, he's not really condemning or praising. He's just saying, perhaps we should pump the brakes and have a broader conversation of what our society is going to be like when we move from a largely script-based culture where we're reading newspapers, where we're reading books, etc., to a media-based culture where we're basically being filled up with trivialities. You know, he uses these examples at the early part of the book that he says, our current president, it was a former movie star. Who is he talking about? Reagan. And we just, you know, had a president who was the host of a reality TV show, right? So, so Postman's point is like, uh, you, 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 your marketability is in how you can be, be perceived, not necessarily by what you say, I'm not saying necessarily anything against Reagan or Trump. I'm just saying that his point is to say we live in this media culture where we think we we think less than we see, right? This guy looks good. He's got a nice smile. He dresses well. If he dressed like a slob, you wouldn't really care what came out of his mouth. And so we're attending to the wrong things is the point that he's making. And our ability to think critically about things is being negatively affected. Um, and so is that the idea that's embedded in some of these technologies before they come online, right? To make man um, have to work less hard, as if there's something wrong with working hard, you see. Um, okay, any thoughts or comments just on kind of Postman's general caution or take, that we at least ask these questions of the things we're making use of and being mindful of what kind of effects they can have. Um, yeah. One thing that occurred to me is that people can ask that question and answer it and realize there's something bad about it. Do it anyway. Right. You see that with drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things. Yeah. I know this isn't going to do me any good, but I'm going to do it anyway because it gives me some temporary benefit or yeah. boost. So that's, I mean, just asking the question and even answering it, I don't know if that's the full solution. Yeah, well, perhaps for the individual and, you know, being purpose not to, you know, let's say being purpose to um, do what is right and virtuous. You know, in the broader conversation, we have people inventing these technologies and everyone just gooing and gawing over them. Um, the, the problem is the, the, ability, the ability component outpacing the question of whether or not it ought to be the case. Should we do this? Should we not do it? But you are right. Like, um, even asking the question doesn't necessarily uh, cause you to arrive at the right. Oh, it might ask you the right action, but it, it might cause you to arrive at the right answer. Yeah. And still do it. Right, or right. Still use it. So well, and, and here, my, my concern here too is the, the people who are developing media and mechanisms <coughs> to be more broadly consumed are not even asking that question. And in fact, if they are asking it, they might be coming up with more malevolent ways to make their devices more addictive, more addictive and appealing, et cetera. And I'll have a quote from Cardaris's book you know, about the developments, per development particularly of video games and the kind of neurobiology. I mean, they, they hire neurobiologists, behavioral psychologists, not to mitigate against the damaging effects of immersive screens, but to actually ramp up their effect which is like horrible, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any, other, any other things here? Yes, Nathan? It reminds me of your presentation on tools. Right. And sort of to what end or what, what is the telos of that tool? Is it a positive thing or is it a negative thing? Right, right. And, and I have that quote in here actually from C.S. Lewis. I won't read it. But this is, this is the difficulty with this, this technological age that there isn't, a clear, there isn't a clear answer to what is the end of a piece of technology such as we have now in the, in the form of a smartphone or an iPad or whatever. Is its end to binge watch Netflix? Is its end to make social connections? Is its end to traffic children? Is its end to call your grandmother on her birthday? Like, it has a seemingly infinite number of uses, so it doesn't have a clear teleology. And I think that's that, yeah, that's a big part of the issue. Also, the, the worldview or you know the religion of those who are creating these things. A lot of these technology. I mean, Facebook was created by a god-hating atheist. 
Yeah. Uh, these new AI glasses and things like that. These are all people who don't worship the true God. And so it's basically the form of their own false God worship. Right. And they're trying to get us caught up in it. That's right, yeah. You can see it's directly at odds with Christianity all the time. Yeah. The current usage. Yeah. And in fact, I'd say if there's one thing that caused the destruction of our society, I mean, there are many things, but if you want to pin it to one, where we are today versus 100 to 200 years ago, it's the television. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's uh, Postman's point, yeah. Yeah, I, I hands down agree with that. Yeah. The thing that caused Christians to believe and behave like pagans is the television. Right. Well, I mean, uh, propaganda is easier to propagate when you have the tube in your house. I mean, this is Orwell's whole point. You know, the one thing he definitely got right was in 1984, which he wrote in 1948, you had the telescreens in everybody's homes and around, you know, wherever you were in town. And they'd have, what's that? Yeah, and they, they would have like, you know, you know, minutes of hate or whatever, where they would just blast the propaganda and everyone would be like, ah, you know, yelling at the screen, et cetera, you know. So, so it has that kind of, uh, it, I mean, it, it's, harder to be, it, it's harder to be overcome by propaganda if it's propaganda that you actually have to go to a place to listen to or that you have to read in long form, right? It's much more effective if you can just put the tube in, the bed, in, in someone's house. Yes? Uh, but when Hitler came to power is that he was able to cheaply mass produce a radio so every house had a radio in it and then he'd give his speeches out and so that's how he got support. Right, yeah. Yeah, so, we, so even, that, even that kind of communication. And I, I think here the point, too, is like, uh, as, as Postman has said in this, this previous quote, um, the, the, the creation of new technologies and so forth giveth and taketh away, and not always in equal measure. So, uh, and then he says, it sometimes creates more than it destroys, sometimes it's the other way around. <clears throat> but we live in a kind of technophiliac age where, where people think, no, it only creates and it doesn't destroy, right? Or, or if it does seem to destroy, in the case of Facebook and trying to broaden out your social connection, it's not that there's something deficient in the premise, right? It's that we, we need to find a way to integrate man more fully into digital life <laughs> through, uh, through virtual reality and so forth. Okay, um, so, uh, so far as like the, the book in review, if you're interested, um, Cardaris' book, this is just kind of a, you know, a, a bland fact, uh, has 14 chapters. The first you know, portion of the book, he sketches the landscape of screen addiction and its effects on uh, children, broadly speaking. And that's his primary concern. His primary concern is, the subtitle of the book is, how screen addiction is hijacking our kids and how to break the trance. As you come to find out, really, a kid becomes addicted to a screen for what reason? I mean, ultimately. <laughs> Did he save up his nickels and dimes in his piggy bank and go to the Apple store and buy the we thing? Put it in front of him. Yeah, because we put it in front of them, right? And again, this isn't an indictment. You know, if kids have iPads or whatever, you know, like our kids watch YouTube videos to learn how to draw or do whatever else. It's not an indictment on doing that. But the unmitigated relinquishing of these technologies that by their very creation are meant to draw such impressionable minds in um, is the problem, right? Is, you know, it, so, so that, you know, because a kid, a kid can get a hold of certain things, um, but he has limitations, you know, especially if he can't work and make money to buy these things. So, um, but that's his, that's his main concern is how are these things affecting kids whose brains are still developing? Right, who haven't who have who haven't actually reached maturation. Chapter six, he addresses specific clinical disorders uh, related to the Globe Kids effect. Chapter seven, uh, titled Mass Media Effects, he talks about the behavior among those who consume it. So he's he's making the case that you know what we take in is what we begin to do, right? And it, I mean it's a fairly simple proposition that we can agree with, right? You you, you are what you eat, so to speak. You, you become what you behold, so the prophets say. The one who worships an idol becomes like it. There are role models. Yeah, yeah. So that, so that these things can you know, have this reciprocal effect where you're not just then passively watching it, but it's affecting you in some way. 
Chapters 8 through 10, he addresses the connection between video games, that is screen addiction and aggression, which goes into specific instances where the worst outcome occurred, namely murder, suicide, mass shootings, and so forth. But he notes that most increase of aggression is attitudinal, agitation, non-criminal offenses. Um, he cites one guy's study who says, well, actually, um, since, since the use of video games has increased, the level of crime has decreased you know, along the same timeline. So he's trying to show a positive relationship between the increased use of video games and the decrease in criminal, uh, criminal behavior. But Cardara says, we're not really concerned merely with reports of criminal behavior, but the increase of aggression itself. And he said, because kids can become more aggressive and act out in such a way in their home that they're not going to be reported on criminally, right? Um, and so that's really the measure, not whether or not there's been more like heinous crimes being committed, although he tries to establish some kind of causal connection uh, between that and the other. Um, but here he's just talking about the increase of agitation. Um, okay, chapter 11, uh, he talks about need for outdoor play. Um, but again, that I think needs the, well, I'll, I'll say something else in just a moment. Uh, number 12, follow the money. He speculates that the increase of tech in schools was not based on the research that technology helps learning. The opposite seems to be the case, but was an industry where money was to be made, right? Um, and the same is probably true of textbooks, et cetera. Like, that's kind of a, it's a racket. You, you keep making new editions of books and... It's also a way to get the kid addicted early. Right, right. I don't, I don't like the word addicted, but getting uh, conditioned to use technology rather than a book. Right. Or writing out. Right, and right. They get that in as early as they can. And then yeah. In third grade, they're on a computer. Right, right. Sure. Yeah, well, and, and he said, you know, most people advance this idea because the supposition is if kids don't learn to use this technology in a technological age, they're going to be behind the ball. Yeah. And, and he said, you know, the, the lie in this regard is that a kid can pick up the use of technology quicker than an adult, right? So, like, a, you know, a parent puts all these restrictions on whatever device their kids have, you know, naively thinking that the kid doesn't already know how to contravene all the blocks or whatever that he's put in place, right? So it doesn't take long for a kid to actually learn this stuff. I mean, I could understand the skill of typing, like I took typing in junior high, but even that, like I could have learned that on my own presumably and not just been like one of the, the plunkers that do, does this thing, but actually learn how to use a keyboard. In any case, um, so that, that doesn't necessarily uh, hold water in terms of what some of the motivations might be. But he thinks it's even more naive to suggest that it's actually advancing or assisting in learning itself. Uh, 13, he touches on uh, virtual reality. Um, and of course, this book was written in 2016. So we're, we're actually quite a bit further along in regard to this particular phenomenon than even when he wrote his book in 2016. And in that same chapter, he mentions e-athletes. Your brother talked to us about this at Bethany Lutheran, right? How they were, they created in, in what did he call it? Esports. Esports, that's right. <laughs> uh, so you can get college scholarships for being good at video games or whatever. Um, which is, yeah, very, so in any case. And then, uh, and then he offers solutions to screen addiction, which really kind of amounts to the, the advice of the Oompa Loompas, which is at the very, at the very minimum to, to give your kids what he calls tech fasts. Um, okay, so that, that's kind of the, the layout of the book. Um, I want to I just cover a few things so that we don't go excessively long here, but um, the, the first would be um, Cardaris' discussion of the dynamics that contribute to excessive screen use. Um, one such dynamic, he says, is lack of meaning and lack of purpose. He writes, I've come to understand that for some, the appeal here is much deeper and more fundamental than just adrenaline. So for some, it's just like they like, they like the, the, the feeling, the adrenaline that they get from, let's say, in the case of video games, when you're playing a video game or um, using some other kind of techie devices. And then he says, indeed, the need for uh, mythical experiences may be hardwired into our human psyche. You see where he's coming from. He's an evolutionary psychologist, basically. Yet, by and large, we have lost that in our modern age. Almost 100 years ago, Jung uh, wrote that the modern world had been demystified and was experiencing a poverty of meaning. 
While the advances of science have certainly immeasurably improved our lives with everything from medical cures to useful household gadgets, the iconoclasm of science has also created a meaning void. Science has stripped us of our myths, telling us that there are no gods or demons, no heaven or hell, no Elysian mysteries, no Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. Indeed, we are told by science that the world is rather cold, mechanistic place without myth or meaning the, necess the necessary lifeblood of the human psyche. Now, we, we can point out all sorts of, we, we can point out all sorts of deficiencies in that analysis, right? <laughs> Which is to say, um, well, number one, it's not, science doesn't do these things, right? That's an absurd notion. Because the people who invent the discipline of science were Christians, right? It's not science as such. It's not the finding out of the mechanisms in the world. I mean, Basil the Great in his Hexameron, his writing on, on Genesis on the, on the sixth day says, if we discover the mechanism of the thing, that doesn't undermine the wonder with which we look at it. It just means we have a better explanation as to how God makes this thing work. So it's not science, but it's a, it's a certain kind of presupposition, a materialistic one, that says, because we've discovered all these mechanisms, myth is entirely laid waste. Meaning is entirely laid waste. For us, we're not concerned so much with, with myths that aren't you know, actually the case or true. Uh, we're concerned with the veracity of the sacred scripture and the reality of the world in which we live that has been made and created by God. Um, so it is certainly true, and Christians have noted this as well, that we've been disenchanted, um, that we've become functional atheists, that we live in a world with the kind of atheist materialistic presupposition in our mind, that there's nothing deeper about what meets our eye, right? And so as a consequence, there is this lack of meaning. And so what do you do? Um, uh, in order to make up uh, for this lack of meaning, well, you do something that actually makes you feel as though uh, you belong in a particular place. He has another quote. Today's flood of addiction is occurring because of our hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive, frantic, crisis-ridden society, which makes most people feel socially and culturally isolated. He has the, he has the account of uh, Adam Lanson. Is it Lanson? The back of the book, The Sandy Hook Shooter. <coughs> Um, in a, back in Connecticut, I think, right? Um, and, and he says, you know, his person was, I think he had autism, ADD, ADHD or something. He was very scrawny and skinny, but he lived in this world of video games where he was this great big buff guy, right? And everybody he played with thought very well of him. So he's, he sort of traded his meaningless, purposeless life that he sort of, and, and this goes into the second point, which is a, a kind of escapism. In, in, in order that he might find meaning. So, he, so under escapism, he says, as I treated and talked to my various young clients, another dynamic also revealed itself, escape. Imagine you're a teenager and just don't feel like you quite fit in, or you don't like the way that you look or live with a dysfunctional family. Or let's say that you feel alone and empty and are often depressed. You hate school and have no friends. In the cruel dynamics of the adolescent hierarchy and pecking order, you are on the outside looking in. Would you escape from that life if you could? For some, the matrix does have its appeal, right? So this is the, the question of Morpheus. Do you take the red pill or do you take the blue pill? Do you see how far the rabbit hole goes? Do you come into reality or do you continue to live in a world that is fundamentally escapist where you don't have to? This is, I mean, first direct on the point. Do you not know that all who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ? Yeah. So we recognize that we're inherently and we can either deal with it in Zuckerberg's false creation, his satanic world, in which we can be whatever we want to be, right. or we can identify with our baptism and put on Christ's righteousness. And then it doesn't matter if you're scrawny or this or that, smart or not, boy, whatever the heck you are, because you're Christ. Right. So it's, it's clearly, this is an antichrist, it's a false yeah. Well, you're trying to put on something else yeah, to be right. something else, right? Um, and, and, and this is a good point that we should exploit, so to speak, from our baptisms, which is to say that I think people have, have this kind of feeling as a general matter because this, this kind of immersive activity has done something to the mind of a lot of people, not just the scrawny junior high kid who doesn't fit in with anybody, but adults even. 
right, who become depressed and under a malaise the more that they use these things. But to find our identi identity in Christ, um, yep. You call it an immersive activity. Yeah. Immersion. Right, right. In water, like baptism. <laughs> right, right. It's, yeah. And that, I mean, so Cardaris uses that phrase that, you know, our, our age of digital screens is much different than the television era because it is immersive, interactive. And that's what, that's what makes it so addictive. You're not, I mean, you're not just passively watching a black and white show, right? Which I suppose you could become addicted to enough. But you're actually entering in and participating. Right? <laughs> Which is also a kind of Christian notion that we're participating in the life of the church. We're participating as a member in the body of Christ. So there are all these trade offs. And when you begin to pay attention, I hadn't made that connection, but when you begin to pay attention to even the close kind of language that's being used, right? Um, it, it, it start, and this is what the devil does, right? He, he sort of mimics and parrots and by parody uh, the, word, the word of God. Okay, uh, escapism, this one is, I think, important. The desire for limitless potential. And I think that this is, you know, when Postman asks the question, what is the idea embedded that is, that is beyond the function of the thing being created? This limitless potential is, I think, the idea embedded in a lot of the things that we use. Technologies like 3D immersive video games and VR offer, as it seems, the ever-increasing and never-ending limitless possibilities which create a very hypnotic grip on kids, Cardara says. The hypnotic pull, along with the stimulating hyper-arousing content, creates a dopaminergic or a dopamine-increasing effect. That dopamine increase becomes the key ingredient in a primordial addiction-forming uh, habit uh, or dynamic. So again, he's got this evolutionary psychology sense, right? Um, but this, this desire to, to be other or beyond what you are, you know, or to be other than you are. Um, and, and so I mentioned this Lex Friedman podcast with Mark Zuckerberg. They, they were in two different, they were, you know, on other sides of the country from each other. They, they have these VR meta goggles on, and they both went through these intensive scans that created a digital image of their face. And during the podcast interview, it goes between scenes of Friedman and Zuckerberg's floating heads and then to them sitting in the, in the stool, you know, like with the goggles on. And I know what they both look like, and, and it was eerie how indistinguishable their digital floating head was from their actual head. Mm. And this Friedman kept saying, I mean, he was almost to the point of tears. It was creepy. He's like, this is like nothing I've ever experienced before. He's like, it's like you're right there. I'm like, yeah, but you have experience being right there with another person, surely. But he means in this other way. And he's like, I, I want this, you know, like, I want to be able to have a beer with my buddy on the beach in this kind of world because the connection is so close. I can't, you know, like, he was just, he, he's, he kept saying over and over and over again, I'm, I'm without words, I'm beyond words. Like I, and then Mark Zuckerberg started to say, you know, uh, if you don't necessarily like your expressions, like some people think that my smile is too flat because maybe he's not really human. Uh, and he said, so my, my digital face, I could, when, I, when my, my real face smiles, my digital face will show more teeth or whatever. And he's like, or you know, for all you know, Lex, I could, I could have not shaved for several weeks, but my, but my you know, scanned head is clean shaven with a haircut, and you can change all of these things. So it's this exact thing, right, to enter in and to become other than what the limits that you've actually been set into uh, suggest. And, and why are they doing this? To go back to the, the idea behind Facebook, it's to create a, a more intimate social connection beyond what the limits of human life essentially force us to. So they, so they think, you know, I'm sure when Facebook first came online, everybody was like, wow, this is so cool. I can see so-and-so's baby, but I'll never see them for 10 years, but I can see all their pictures, blah, blah, blah. Um, they think, oh, this is, this, is like, this is making up for what we were lacking. And then everybody's now become depressed. So now they're like, they're doing the VR thing, and they're like, this is like nothing I've ever experienced before. And I have this new social connection, but there's going to be some, you know, because the premise is false. Um, because it's not, were you going to say something, Nathan? Yeah, I just, I've been, I get sent me that, so I watched that interview, which was as creepy as you just described. <laughs> Talk with your dead grandma or whatever, mm -hmm. 
Friedman mentions that in the interview. It made me think of the, the movie Ghost, I think, or something was it back in like 1990, mm. where Whoopi Goldberg conjured up the spirit of whoever had died, and then mm -hmm. the person got the, oh, the husband wife, I think, the yeah. wife of the husband had died. So now, I mean, we can, it's just, well, Friedman had said, I want to be able to talk to my loved ones, and not just the ones that are living, but I want there to be basically be an AI version of my, my dad or my grandpa that I, can, that I can program, and then I can go have conversations and, and make the AI you know, talk predictably to me as my dad would have. Talk about, I mean, it's literally the mouth. That's what came yeah. from. Well, and, and, it, and it's also, um, you, know, you said earlier that this is, these are being made by God-hating atheists. They're actually God-loving, except they want to be God. Right? <laughs> it is true that they're atheists, but, but the, the jig's up. What they're, what they're pining after is eternal life. Yes. And they're going to uh, do it. I mean, they're yeah. trying to figure out how to download your right. brain onto a computer. Right. It's yeah. madness. I mean, and That's Luther... they're going for is eternal life. Yeah. yeah. And Luther, 500 years ago, in the, in the large catechism, when he's talking about baptism, he says... You know, if, if suddenly a doctor appeared on the scene and he had, you know, a pill that promised, you know, the fountain of youth and everlasting life, oh, how the world would pour the money in. And here we're offering the sacraments and the promise of everlasting life, and nobody wants what's on offer. So exactly right. And that's what they're doing now. They're pouring in the money. Apple, I, you know, the Apple goggles. How much are those? 3500 bucks. <laughs> So, you know, it's like they're, they're paying big money to create what the Christian church is preaching. And at some point, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna come. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how close the irony is to their face. They can't even see, like, how thick it is, right? But it's like that joke about the scientists and all these people who are calling their way up to the top of the mountain. And when they get up there, there's a couple of theologians who have been there the whole time, you know, <laughs> talking about the book of Genesis or whatever. Um, so it's like we, we, have, we have these answers on offer for what man recognizes that he lacks. This is all like Solomon says, God has put eternity into man's heart. And so what are these actions but a desire for what God has actually put in the heart, but they're filling it with the wrong thing. You're, you're never actually going to achieve it by your own merit, by your own ingenuity, by your own labor and work. Uh, but that's what, what they're attempting. Going back to a slightly different point, the, uh, it's interesting, I was reading that um, these guys actually know how harmful this stuff is because their own kids, they're not educated. They're sitting at the schools that don't use computers at all. Right. I mean, so they know how damaging it is. Right. They don't want their own kids going through it, but they'll have your kids do it. Yeah, yeah that was actually in my outline to address yeah, it's really that uh, Cardaris you know, has, you know, like Steve Jobs, yeah, none of his kids ever had, had iPads. They, they went to all tech-free schools, et cetera. So you have to ask, again, it's, it's about asking questions. If the people developing these things are unwilling to give them to their children, but they want you to put the money out to give it to your own, what does that say? <laughs> I don't think that the head of the drug cartel in Mexico is giving fentanyl to his grandchildren. Right? But he wants your grandchildren to be addicted to the product. So there, you know, in some way, that's not that's not substantively different. There was this other this other thing that Nathan, you had sent me, and I never got a chance to watch the TED talk that Cardaris mentions in this book. I couldn't even get through it. Um, it was so creepy. I was trying to I was trying to see where he, where, you know, some of the quotes that this guy was uh, saying about how they, you know, essentially this like, well, we want to. We want to have more connection. That's that's the premise of the guy's talk. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's 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 just like a strange thing, and the people are sitting there captivated and listening. Like, yes, we want more connection. We want more connection. We want more, and it's like, you have it. Yeah. But but you're 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 taking up things that are actually creating this kind of division. And that guy created the holograph. Right. The holograph right. Image. Yeah. Which is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, la the last one that he mentions with regard to what contributes to excessive screen use is desire for novelty. So he says technologies like 3D immersive games and VR create the opportunity for novelty, something our brains are hardwired to explore. Our brains are wired, he says, for finding immediate reward. With technology, novelty is the reward. You essentially become addicted to novelty. 
and you know, leaving aside the kind of jargon of the, evolu you know, the, psych the evolutionary psychologist, it is true that, that man has this kind of obsession for things that are new. Melanchthon knew this, right? He writes this hymn, uh, Lord Jesus Christ with us abide, and he says, the haughty spirits Lord restrain who o'er thy church with might would reign and always set forth something new, devised to change thy doctrine true. So again, the Christian church has known this, right? That man is obsessed with novelty, with things that he's not encountered before. C.S. Lewis in his uh, autobiography, Surprised by Joy, this is the sense that he has as he's, as he's you know, in, in, the, in the time of his life, he's describing the time of his life when he's an atheist. The surprise by joy is, at the end, you know, he's surprised to find out that what he had run away from as a child, as an Anglican, turned out to actually be true. That, that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do exist. They have created all things. They have baptized and et cetera. The joy is the conversion unto the Christian faith. But he says there's these, these experiences through life where you have like a flash of joy. Like some, and, it's, and it's hard to describe. It's exhilarating. Right? Well, novelty does has that effect, right? It's like, oh, I've not I've not experienced this before, and you want more of it, right? Well, eternity is going to be like the the, ex, the experience of a new thing, but forever. Like that that the elation is going to be able to be endured without the exhaustion, etc. Um, but for the time being, man is obsessed with um, with finding new things, uh, right? For which he can. Um, for which he can pursue and then displace the old things. Um, uh, he, he compares this to the use of a slot machine. Uh, he's talking about the game. Um, oh, what's the game that all the kids play with the blocks? Uh, oh boy. It's three dimensional. Yes. Yes, Minecraft. Yeah, it's Minecraft. Yeah. He's talking about Minecraft and how the, the, the rarest element in the game is ore, but you don't know where it is. It's strewn throughout the map. So, like the. the the thing that keeps you plugged in is, I'm just going to keep hammering away till I get to the ore. And he compares this to the using of a slot machine. He says, just as the casino slot machine, uh, this is known as a variable ratio reward schedule, the most habit-forming and addicting reward schedule. Like, it only will take me one more pull and I'll get the jackpot. Well, just, oh, it's only one more quarter, just another pull, right? <laughs> and so a kid is in a game and he's trying to collect these resources. He's like, well, if I stop digging now and... Maybe if I just dig one more, and I'll and and believe me, like I, I used to play uh, Halo uh, and other games on an Xbox, and that's a real thing, right? I eventually sold my Xbox because I was like, I this is insane how much I'm playing this thing. So it it uh, so it, it it does have a way of, of getting you in by what he's calling the var variable ratio reward schedule. A couple more desire for more connection. This goes uh, also to perhaps the escapism, but he's saying this accounts for the use of screens. Recent studies back up the theory that as social media and technology have made us more connected, we become increasingly depressed. And then he says another study indicates that people are 10 times more likely to suffer from depression today than in 1945, with women and teenage girls twice as susceptible as men. Because he says the screen addicting mm -hmm. habits that women uh, and girls have differ from men and boys. Men and boys tend to get addicted to video games. And there's at least the illusory sense of a connection because you can actually play online with other people, you can talk to them, et cetera. Women kind of get captivated by the social media apps like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And they see everybody's cookie cutter lives and then they're depressed that their life isn't as good as theirs. Right? So, um, so yes, it's, it's, it's had this negative effect. Being alone doesn't agree with us, he says. Biologists believe that human beings evolved. Okay, again as social animals because being with others had an evolutionary benefit. We know it's not good for man to be alone, not because of just simply an evolutionary utilitarian benefit, but because God has declared it so, right? And so he's put us into communion. So it is certainly true that being alone doesn't agree with us because it doesn't agree with God's own prescription when he makes Adam in the first place, right? And that was before the fall. And then he says, perhaps even more worrisome than the addictive nature of our new digital way of connecting is the idea that electronic connection does not seem to satisfy our deep-seated need for true human contact. What in fact seems to have been spawned has been the illusion of social connection via a medium that, a medium that has our dopamine receptors on perpetual high alert as we anticipate, like Pavlovian dogs, the next ping that promises to offer us novelty and pleasure of a text, instant message, tweet, Facebook update, or Instagram photo. Um, so, 
So it's like we keep, we keep eating this thing that we think is going to fill the void of my lack of social connection, but the more I use it, the more it harms me. Um, the last one he says, uh, um, this is just a description of the psychiatric symptoms uh, of people who have become so addicted. He says, he describes the psych psychiatric symptoms this way, that people suffer from a derealization and a depersonalization. So contrary to Whitman's poem, a, a removing of yourself from that which is real unto that which is unreal. And then, the, and then the way to get them back, right? He says the tactics to bring one out of this dissociative experience uh, is described as grounding techniques. Essentially, you help the client use his or her five senses to feel immediacy, the physicality of the present moment. So, so he's just basically in psychological terms describing how, you know, the, and, and this is like in extreme cases, right? It's not like, oh my goodness, my kid looked at a phone and now he's going to have a depersonalization or like he's going to be removed from the, from the real world. But when people are um, horribly affl afflicted by their use of these things, um, uh, they have to be grounded, which is to say they have to be brought back into the, their own limits, right? Using all the five senses. Yeah. Which we do in the divine service. With right. The smell, the smell, and so forth. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, because prayer is embodied. It's not just an intellectual, and faith is embodied. It's not just an intellectual, I think these things and I have all the right answers, but it's a kind of posture, kneeling, bowing, making the sign of the cross, feeling the water, tasting the bread, the consecrated bread, which is his body and the blood, um, all of that, smelling the incense, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. Real. Right, right. So, liturgical worship is real, in the, I mean, in the physicality sense. Right, right. Yeah, exactly, right. It and can't so, be held over Facebook Live or YouTube right. or whatever. Right, not yet. But that's what they're going for. Because what, what Zuckerberg uh, said to this Friedman was, we want to figure out how to integrate human life into digital life or digital life into human life. He said, I see in the future that to have a full human experience we have, to, we have to have participation in the digital wherever we go, right? So you walk around, perhaps you, have, you don't have the goggles set on, maybe they get them to be like this, or a contact lens. And so I see Noah, but then I also see some things floating around his head, right? You know, or like if you watch some of the demonstrations that people have put on their YouTube channels with their Apple Pro goggles, um, you know, the guy's like, well, here, over here is my television, but there's really not a television there. It's, it's just, it's popping up in the goggles. So you, you see a big screen TV there. Or he's like, here's my list of things to do, and it's on the fridge, but it's really not on the fridge. So you could have like, you could have essentially no fixtures in your house, but you could see them, right? You know, I can make my terrible looking chair look like a nice recliner, and so I'm gonna go sit in my nice recliner, but some like, you know, tattered, you know, it's just like, so this is what, but this is what they're going for. And I, I'm not going to say, I'm never going to say never. Like, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but they'll, they'll figure out some way. Because as we, as we talked about in that presentation on tools and man, man has this great potential and God recognizes it. Now that they, now that they're all speaking in one tongue, nothing will be impossible to them. So God recognizes the, the near uh, limitless potential of what man can push, innovate himself into, um, and even unto hell, right? Um, the last thing here is the telling facts that, me, that um, David already mentioned, how that these tech developers uh, are not letting their children use these things. And that should cause a serious pause. The guy making it isn't letting his own kid use it. Um, there's, some, there's some question as to why, why you ought to, right? Um, I'll just run through these, uh, through these last things very, very quickly. We, I won't read the, uh, because we're kind of going on to more than an hour here. Um, just the, the general dangers associated with excessive screen use. So again, Cardaris describes uh, the contrast between television and what we use today by the phrase immersive and interactive digital screens. There's something that makes them more addictive when you can actually touch the screen and do this, right? Um, 
And so the dangers associated with uh, excessive screen, screen use, devices were made to be maximally addictive, right? So he says this, and this is a quote of another, uh, another researcher. Gaming companies will hire the best neurobiologists and neuroscientists to hook up electrodes to the test gamer if they don't elicit the blood pressure that they shoot for, typically 180 over 120 or 140 within a few minutes of playing, and if they don't show sweating and an increase in their galvanic skin response, they go back and tweak the game to get the maximum addicting and arousing response that they are looking for. I mean, that's like, that's like, so you're essentially then, I mean, you, you've, you've volunteered yourself for this kind of test, right? But then you're mass producing it and putting it out there and saying, we want the rats to be addicted to the heroin laced water and see what they do, right? So it, it is, and that's the other thing, right? We're running an experiment for which we are the gerbils because we don't know what kind of long-term effects this is gonna have, right? Um, so again, that's just something to, to have in the mind. Uh, he says also that the excessive screen use reduces attention uh, because of overstimulation. So he says, when I talk to parents who uh, have this like sense, well, you know, little Johnny can pay attention because he just stares at his iPad all day. Look at how well attended he is. His response is, no, he's being overstimulated by constantly new <clears throat> images, which have a way, but, but ultimately it's reducing little Johnny's ability to attend to things that actually require, you know, uh, a mind that is active and, and paying attention and thinking, right? Because some of these activities can be relatively passive and they can draw in because of the way that they stimulate with you know, like a hyper realization, a, a hyper reality, right? So the colors are brighter. You know, you start to play video games, it's like, yeah, that, the mountain in the game looks much more attractive than that mountain out there. The trees in the game are much greener. More real and real. Yeah, right. I was listening to Elon Musk, uh, and he was talking about the beautiful art in this video game, and he's like, basically my only pastime is just play video games. He just plays video games all the time, and then invents all this other stuff, right? But the more real and real, and that's not only like a video game thing. I won't mention the other ways that the, this can be, let's say, sexually exploited, but that's the, that's the whole idea behind some of those sexual exploitations is to make the thing more real than real. Yeah. Like these AI girlfriends now are right. making millions and millions of dollars. Right. It's, it's not even real. Yeah, to titillate, the, perfect. Yeah, well, to titillate these sensations. And the thing about it is once you start, it, it is like a drug, right, where you're, you have to have a little bit more. And a little bit more, well, that, and a little bit more. And also, you know, whatever it is, but it, it, like with a beautiful woman, you know, that you can perfect, you know. Right. Suddenly, sadly, it doesn't look that great. Right. The Stepford Wives. Really yeah. messed up. You ever seen that movie? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Uh, harms imagination, he says. Interactive multimedia leaves very little to the imagination. Like a Hollywood film, multimedia narratives include such specific representations that less and less is left to the mind's eye. When you read a novel, much of the color, sound, and motion come from you, right? So the, the reduction in imagination. Uh, leaving nothing to the imagination, uh, unfettered access to tech simultaneously robs a child of his innocence while at the same time perpetuating his adolescence. So he says, as technology and information free-for-all rob kids of their innocence and blur the notion of childhood because they're encountering things online that, that do kind of cause them to, in a strange way, grow up too fast and yet not finally grow up. So blur the notion of childhood. It also paradoxically perpetuates and extends their adolescence. Historian Gary Cross describes this phenomenon as delayed social adulthood, in which adolescence in the tech era is being redefined to extend well into people's 20s and 30s. <laughs> so you're not, you're not quite grown up, right? You're, you're somehow stunted. Um, and, and this one I thought was particularly interesting. Reduces resilience and patience. Uh, so he says... Um, he says, Dr. Leonard Sachs writes extensively about adolescent malaise in a book titled Boys Adrift. In addition to being addicting, according to Sachs, video games do not engender the sense of resilience or the patience and drive that the real world requires. In real life, when people lose at sports, they have to lick their wounds and process those experiences as they learn to eventually get back on the horse to compete another day. 
All of that fosters resilience and emotional growth. When you lose in a video game, you hit the reset button, game on. <laughs> so the reduction of resilience, and that's an important, uh, I mean, for you boys too especially, and for the men, that's an important, uh, that's an important quality in life, mm -hmm. to be a resilient person. And to have something potentially attacking resilience, because you know, because of the immediacy of a game, right? That you can you can flip it to the next thing, and you can just keep resetting it. You don't actually have to deal with, as you just said, the the notion of the possibility of loss. What is um? How would you define resilience? Well, we had that we had that event in the summer. Um, resil you know, the the word resilience comes from the the Latin resilio, and it means to spring back. And it's almost like the sense of an elastic band, right? That it can be stretched to a certain extent, but then it goes back to its form. So it's like uh, a re to, to, to recall back to, to something, to like your original, your original form. But in, in terms of you know, Christianity, I think endurance is a fairly good synonym for resilience. Perseverance. Yeah, perseverance. It's not, you know, like I said in that presentation, it's not, it's not the the sense of resistance. Don't tread on me, bro, because eventually resistance is going to be treaded on. But, but resilience is when you're treaded on, you endure, you persist, you persevere. And so, you know, and we don't have, we actually don't have things that are training us to be resilient. And we have many things that are training us to be the, the opposite of it, right? To not endure patiently. I mean, we could think of things much more pressing, right? But how impatient we become because everything is so available to us and how quickly it can come and so forth. Um, uh, the, the last three here, and then we can kind of wrap up, or the last several. He says, Incre it increases distractibility and reduces impulse con control, can negatively affect memory. It has a numbing effect. That one is a little, you know, I was telling Nathan this, I think. He, he talks about a guy who had suffered third degree burns in Afghanistan because he got blown up by an IED. And these researchers were trying to figure out how do we rehabilitate these soldiers without getting them addicted to narcotics? Because they're in such pain that we have to pump them full of morphine to get them fully recuperated. And so they started to have this kind of theory like, well, maybe video games have, have a pain reducing effect. And so they created one called Snow World and it was very, fairly simple, right? Fairly non-immersive. Penguins basically walking across a screen and there's some song playing in the background and it's a first person shooter but you're throwing snowballs trying to hit these penguins and knock them over. And this is by, this is by self-reporting. This one soldier who had suffered these third degree burns said that he had more pain reduction playing the game than he did being on morphine. And Cardara says, well this is a good advancement so far as rehabilitating people without getting them addicted to narcotics, but what does it say when our children are playing these things to the same, like what kind of numbing effect is it having if it can get a guy through his rehabilitation after having suffered those kind of burns? So again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not prescribing anything, but that is just something to put in your mind and say, makes me at least wonder, you know, uh, you know about uh, what, what possible effect this could have on somebody who's not even, you know, whose cognitive abilities are not fully developed. And then the last one is the increase of aggression. Here it's again not so much that the playing of video games is ipso facto going to lead to extreme violent behavior, but I think we probably all experienced that excessive use of screen can just increase agitation itself, right? Where you become a more irritable person. You can't be interrupted because you're doing this thing over here, right? Instead of attending to what you really ought to attend. And so, I mean, and, and I think that that's just like obviously true. Um, the last thing that I might say here is, uh, and then we can, we can conclude or if there are any questions, but the last thing I would say here is the dissociation from, the dissociation from just real life. There's a book by a guy called Dietrich von Hildebrand called The Art of Living, and it's a book about moral value and moral virtue. And the first chapter is on reverence. And he says reverence is that, it, it, reverence is essentially an attitude that recognizes the moral value in being of whatever sort. Like a tree has a particular kind of value, 
but it's not the same kind of value as you know, a sentient animal. And a sentient animal's value isn't the same as a human being's. So reverence recognizes the moral value of the world that God has made. And I think the issue that